So, a YouTuber or a cult leader named Hyper Ian, right? This guy, man, if this, okay, so he claims that he's not a Satan worshiper or an atheist or anything like that. <laughs> but but let's look at the story, you know what I'm saying? Let, since he, he tries to act like he knows the Bible so well, right? He, he, he knows this book so well. He knows the Holy Bible so well. Well, let's break them down because I don't think anybody really, really put in an effort to break them down. And you know what? That's what I'm going to do because I've seen a lot of his videos. I went through the videos and I was like, I can't believe what this guy is doing. First of all, this guy is the ultimate finesser, the ultimate finesser, okay? The most malip manipulative, demonic, satanic person I've ever witnessed on the internet. You know what I'm saying? So check this out. Let me break it down here. Let, 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 let's, let's, let's talk about it. You know what I'm saying? So, so Satan, right? A fallen angel, right? That he was, he was literally cut. You know what I'm saying? He got kicked out of heaven. You know what I'm saying? For being exactly the way <laughs> that this guy is being. He, Satan wanted to be worshipped over God. He wanted to take God's place. You know what I'm saying? He was given godly powers to create plants to do anything he was a god you know what i'm saying but he wasn't the god you know what i'm saying um and he wanted to be the god he wanted to be worshipped he wanted to be the number one he wanted to take god's place greed right um and i think we know what greed has done to our world right take a look around so i think we can figure out what's good and evil right and what people's intent actually is right what type of, if you ever hear, listen to anything to do with the Bible, there's a lot of principles and morals inside of the Bible that actually do nothing but make somebody a better person, regardless if you believe in a God or not, right? What is the purpose or what is the good that is going to come out of this guy, Hyper Ian, sitting there trying to discredit the Bible? while he's wearing black makeup and all doing all these satanic symbolisms. And I looked on his other Instagram posts, and this guy is a straight demon, okay? These guys are like practicing satanic wor worshiping rituals, like literally basically drinking blood of like babies and shit. Like I've never seen, like these guys are doing all types of demonic satanic stuff on their Instagram stuff. But they're trying to claim that they're doing some good by picking apart the Bible. Well, first of all, the guy is the biggest liar I've ever seen in my life. So let's break it down. He's doing exactly what Satan was doing and how he got cast out in the first place. <laughs> okay, because he wanted to be worshipped. So this Hyper Ian guy has a huge follow. He has like one point something million, you know, subscribers on YouTube, right? He has a follow, a cultic following. They literally do what he says. He has them under his power and his control and his command. They think that he is a god. They think that he has, is the ultimate, all-knowing, knowledge, you know, filled, you know, whatever. They, they just, you know, it's crazy, right? So here's the thing. This is what Satan already did. Satan got cast out for this. You know what I mean? So he is resembling exactly what Satan represents. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to discredit God and, di and discredit, you know, God's word. You know what I'm saying? So, and, and and don't call me, don't, you know, I'm a follower of Christ, you know what I'm saying? But don't call me a Christian, you know what I'm saying? Because, first of all, I'm still struggling in my in my journey, you know what I mean? So I'm not show, putting myself as an example of what a Christian should be or what a follower of Christ should be. Because I would be a bad example, you know what I'm saying? There's better examples, you know what I'm saying? So, but at the same time, my development and process that I'm going through spiritually you know, if you go and watch my music videos from, you know, five years ago when I was out there where I was at, you know what I'm saying, selling drugs, gang banging and stuff like that, this God's word changed my heart. It gave me a feeling inside of my heart that I never had before. I didn't have a heart before and I had no remorse for human life. I was evil and I actually knew that Satan was real before I experienced God. And by the way, I experienced God without even reading a Bible before I ever even picked a Bible up. I experienced something that was undeniable to me. It changed my life. It totally turned me around. It told, like, you know what I'm saying? It didn't brainwash me. It didn't make me like, hello, sir, hello, ma'am, and like, you know, I'm some Bible thumper or something. Like, I was still a G. I was still a gangster. God can take gangsters and turn them and show them, yo, 
this is what you're doing. You're being used by the enemy and you think you're powerful. It's a false sense of power that I was tapping into, but it is real power and you can tap into it and it's dark and it's evil and it comes directly from Satan himself. So this guy's tapping into that power. I've already tapped into that power. I know it's real. And actually, I knew that Satan was real and the devil was real by tapping into that power before I ever even believed there was a God. I didn't even believe in God. I believed in the devil. That's how real this is because I've seen and witnessed the devil, literally, intellectually. I've seen it move and do things in front of me and I'm like, whoa, Satan is real. Evil is real. Let me tap into that so I can get whatever I want. And I did get whatever I want. I had money and I was doing evil and, and, and I was smarter than everybody else because I tapped into that knowledge. Satan is very, very smart, very slick. He's the smartest. He used to be a god. He can, out, he can outsmart any human. This man is tapping into that. That's why he seems so knowledgeable, but it's pure evil. And let me show you an example. Like I said, this guy is twisting everything in the Bible. He's twisting everything. Most of the things that he's talking about were cult cultic people that were is Israelites that were you know claimed to worship God but they didn't they were worshiping symbols like Asherah and all that stuff that was a cultic object okay it was a piece of wood that they carved out that they worshiped over God these people did not know God they weren't of God because God clearly says and I'm going to show all the passages about what God says about false you know idolizing you know false gods you know what I mean um it was a cult, you know what I'm saying, and and it had nothing to do with God. God didn't didn't you know um, support that. These people, you're going off of bro. So I had I had to figure this out for myself. So I did, you know what I'm saying. I'm not playing around, like you know what I mean. Like I'm you know the evidence study Bible. You know what I'm saying. This breaks down every single doubt or disagreement or claim that that come when it comes to the Bible or contradictions and all that stuff. So, one of the first things that it says, either way, let me get to the story real quick. I'm trying to make this fast. That's why I'm talking fast. It's already going to be a huge long video. It's going to be an hour long. And I'm going to keep making videos, breaking this guy down because I can see that he's lying. I come from the streets, bro. You know what I mean? You're not fooling nobody except for a bunch of emo kids. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're not fooling real dudes that really did real evil. If I ever, bro. I'm telling you right now, you would get beat up and, and robbed and, and, you know what I mean, you would be treated like a, you know what I mean, you would have no pull, no power. The only way this man has power is through the internet. To people that are vulnerable, he's manipulated and taken advantage by manipulating, you know, history, you know, biblical things. Like, you know what I mean, he, he's, he's a mastermind when it comes to manipulation. And that's because he's tapped into the satanic power, Okay. That's why he it seems so intelligent, seems so knowledgeable, right? He's tapped in to literally Satan's power. And he knows that. But he'll never say it. Because one of the biggest things that Satan does is acts like he doesn't exist. The devil's not real. It doesn't exist. Because how can you defend yourself against an enemy that you can't see? You can't. You are at the will of that demon, of that beast. And many people are, in this case, with him. So, I'm going to just tear his whole empire down, you know what I mean? And I won't stop. Every single video he makes, I'm going to correct what the truth really is and what he's saying about the Bible. First of all, God didn't have a wife. That was another cult, okay? Like I said, that was the Israelites that were claiming all this stuff, and, and, and they were going against God in, in the Bible and stuff like that. I'm going to break it down in detail. You know what I mean? I'm not a professional at this, like this master manipulator. He knows what he's, he's been doing this for a long time. Okay. He's got his position figured out. You know what I'm saying? So I'm coming into the ring, you know, pretty much like not even armed. You know what I'm saying? But here's the thing. I know he's lying. I know what he's talking about. Exactly what he's talking about. I know the Bible because when I was in jail, I had nothing else in my cell except for a Bible, and I challenged it intellectually. I didn't even agree, didn't even believe in it. Now, before I read the Bible, before I went to jail, I had an experience that, you know, I called out to God. I seeked God out wholeheartedly, and He proved Himself and actually revealed Himself to me in multiple ways in a series of events that were unmistakable and undeniable. It stuck with me for the rest of my life, and it hasn't stopped ever since once I opened up to God. If you come to God with a closed heart, he will never reveal himself to you. You will live a lifetime and never experience anything 
supernatural or anything godlike. God will never ever do anything to show his existence to you if you approach him in that manner, which these people already have and are. Not everybody is going to understand God's word because it wasn't meant for them. It says that in the Bible as well. So it'll be like a foreign language to them. So they'll mock it and doubt it. But anyways, I'm going to actually put in an effort, put in an effort to break this all down. I've never done anything like this before. I'm not no professional when it comes to the Bible and like, you know, uh, some historical, like, you know, scientists or something like that. You know what I mean? And, but I can see what's clearly happening, what this guy is doing. <laughs> and somebody that's really real, that really comes, this guy, this is what disturbs me, right? These guys are the fakest people ever. These are the, the most lying, manipulative demons that exist, right? But the thing is, they're trying to, they think being evil is cool. They never been on the real side of evil. You know what I'm saying? I really been on the real side of evil, homeboy. You know what I'm saying? You think you're evil? You know what I'm saying? But you won't even admit it. That, That's just, at least I can admit I knew at one point in time I was doing evil and I was on some, on some evil stuff. You know what I'm saying? But this guy is pretending like he's not. Like he isn't practicing, you know, satanic rituals. You know what I'm saying? Like, he isn't um, doing exactly what Satan did and what Satan wants to do, which is mislead people and guide them away from the Word of God and away from God by saying that God's a liar um, and that he's the truth. He wants the worship. He wants the praise. And that's exactly what Hyper Ian is doing, right? That's why he has a following. That's why he, he believes in himself on that type of a level like he's a God. I already seen his website and all the lies that he's trying to brainwash and teach people and put them through the ring put them through the ringer, and convert them. It, it, it's insane. But anyways, let's, first of all, right, he talked about, let me see, let me get my notes, like, yo, this is, this is what I'm trying to do, like, I'm not even, I don't even do stuff like this, but I knew that I had to step my, I, like, I gotta get, I gotta get in the ring, you know, and, you know, it's not going to be easy with these manipulators that are tapped into the to the demonic satanic power of, of the devil himself. And, you know, Satan is not somebody to be taken lightly. Even Jesus didn't take him lightly. You know what I'm saying? It's not a joke, right? It's very, very serious. Um, anyway, so he talks about um, more than one God, right? discrediting the Trinity and saying that that's not what it meant because the Trinity came later or something like that. What are you talking about? The, the Word of God was originally built on the Trinity. <laughs> there was the Word. There was God. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, Which I got all the passages. I'm going to literally break it down. So, at the beginning, there was already the Trinity. So what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Already. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't work already. You know what I'm saying? He knows that he had to discredit the Trinity immediately by saying that it, the Trinity wasn't even discovered until later or something like that. But he like, what? Like the first thing in the Bible it talks about is that. You know what I'm saying? Like the, what? Which I have the passages. I'm going to break it all down. I literally like, you know what I mean? Like I'm really putting effort into this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm trying to look for the... In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God, whose name was John. So I'm in, I'm in the John 1. You know what I'm saying? Um, like I said, I'm not, I'm not a professional with this stuff, but I knew right away, even somebody like me that doesn't even know the Bible that much, knew that this guy was lying. Like, I have a limited amount of knowledge from the Bible, just, you know, since I was 18. If you want to know about my story to match up with all this stuff, because you might think that I'm a contradiction or I'm lying or something like that, 
I'm going to make a video and break it down in detail. This is my first attempt at this, but I'm just saying. Okay, let's talk about the Bible contradictions, right? Right here, Bible contradiction. Are there multiple gods? As this verse implies, the verse that he brought up in that video. And that video is, God had a secret wife that was banned from the Bible. False. There is absolutely no proof that anything of that nature was re removed from the Bible. Um, but bottom line is, um, okay, let me read it out. Are there multiple gods as this verse implies? Or is there only one as duet, or sorry, as duet 6 verse 4 states? which is a book in the Bible. That's just short form for the full name. Anyways, hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God. The Lord is one. There is only one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. The Bible teaches us that God is triune by nature. He exists eternally as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three, the Trinity, right off the, right off the rip. One God in three divine. So that's the us that he's lying about. There's his first lie. It's totally lying. Co-equal persons. For example, scripture reveals that Jesus Christ, God, the Son, was pre-existent before he was manifest in human form. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. That's the Spirit. John 1, verse 2 to 14, 2 and 14. Jesus said himself, And I, my Father, are one. John 10, 30. For verses mentioning the three persons of the Trinity, see Matthew 3, 16 and 17. John 14 and 26. 15 and 26. 2 Corinthians 13 and 14. I think it's uh, Galatians or something like that. I just want to make sure uh, uh, I'm saying it right. Galatian, Galatians 4 to 6. Peter 1 to 2. 1 John 5, 7. For how the Trinity works in redemption, see Acts 10.38, comment in this specific book. There's a comment there. So Acts 10.38. Maybe I'll try and go over there to this. Okay. 10.38. The Trinity at work in redemption. In every major phase of the redemption, each person of the Godhead is directly involved. Their involvement in each successive phase may be set out as follows. Incarnation. The Father incarnated the Son in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. See Luke 1 verse 35. Number two, baptism in the Jordan River. The Spirit descended on the Son and the Father spoke his approval from heaven. See Matthew 3 verse 14 and 17. Number three, public ministry. The Father anointed the Son with the Spirit. See Acts 10 38. The crucifixion. Jesus offered himself to the Father through the Spirit. See Hebrew 9 verse 14. The resurrection. The Father resurrected the Son by the Spirit. See Acts 2 32. And Rome 1 and 4. Pen What's that? Pentecost. From the Father, the Son received the Spirit, whom he then poured out on his disciples. See Acts 2, verse 33. Each person of the Godhead, us, and I meaning this reverently, was jealous to be included in the process of redeeming humanity. Anyways. So... He's not showing the full story. You know what I mean? He's not really... He's taken these these cults that literally like turned against God, that are worshipping cultic objects over God, and he's relating that and connecting that to God. 
as for the um, you know killing children in, in, in Egypt uh, saying that God's a destructive God and stuff like that you know God unleashes his wrath on evil you know what I'm saying look at the court system right pedophiles and rapists and stuff like that and murderers that murder innocent people are killed in the system so how is it that God doesn't have the authority to kill you're saying well it's women and children women get killed in the system for for murdering people they get the death sentence <laughs> you know what I'm saying as for children I understand that but here's the thing historically and biblically that far back there were like bloodlines that were like rebelling against God and stuff like that. That literally were only going to grow up and sprout as evil. That's all they were going to do. And God is all knowing. Of course, he knows that this bloodline is literally needs to be wiped out because it, 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 it rejects its own creator. You know what I'm saying? We already don't deserve to live because imagine if you had a kid, right? And your kid was like, just looks at you. I don't. I don't believe you exist. You're not my. You're not my father, and just abandon you. Like we're all rejectors of our own creators. Could you imagine? Like you know what I mean. What that would feel. Like? But bottom line is, we're already on borrowed time. Sin is never was never supposed to exist. God has the authority to wipe it out through a bloodline, regardless if it's unfortunately children. You don't know what place He has for those children. Maybe they haven't sinned yet. You know what I mean? And and maybe God wanted to, you know, basically, if they were to grow up and sin against God and sin against themselves, they were going to go to hell anyways, regardless. Let's say, like, you know, um, after or before Christ or after Christ, whatever, like, metaphorically speaking. You know what I'm saying? So, technically, if God eliminated them when they were children, when they were innocent, they would go to heaven. Maybe God foreseen that they and he actually saved them and they went to heaven. How do you know? You don't know. We don't know. You know what I'm saying? Bottom line is, if anybody has the authority to kill, it's it's, it's God. You know what I'm saying? People kill kids and do all types of evil stuff all over the country in different cultures and they think that's normal and that's right. You know what I'm saying? Um, but bottom line is, but it's not, it's it's a problem now when God does it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for the greater good of the future, whatever that may be, a rebellious bloodline, I don't know. Maybe, you know, he knew that those children were going to be become sinners and were going to die in their sin anyways and going to go to hell for that. You know what I'm saying? So he saved them, if anything. You don't have the ability to comprehend on, on uh, to a capacity like that of what God understands and knows and why things happen the way they happen. Also, why does God allow evil to, to happen? God gives us free will. God is only allowing evil to exist for a period of time before he comes and wipes it out. You know what I mean? And 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 here's the thing. Without free will, if you know, if God got rid of evil right away and never allowed any evil to happen, that means we would not have free will to to even do evil in the first place, which means we are not free, which means we don't come to our creator creator out of love. We 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 exist and we come to him uh, out of out of control that's not a loving god you know what i mean so even know that evil can happen and he allows it to happen he gives us will we are the ones that make the decision to do evil and let evil corrupt us so that that's not valid either it doesn't make no sense i have another video you know what i'm saying um anonymous is going to break this down for us you know what i'm saying in 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 more detail all right about that we're going to switch over and hear what anonymous has to say he's going to break down every single thing anonymous is going to break down every single thing that that he said and use actual bible scripture you know what i'm saying actual facts historical biblical and stuff like that this guy is taking cults and what they did and then calling it god's will saying that god is commanding these things to happen god allows free will okay um, and, and it's all going to be broke. Everything that he said is going to be broken down in detail. You have to pay attention to listen. Okay. So let's get to that. Was God married? Was the old Testament revised to hide evidence that God ruled alongside a heavenly queen? These questions are in the news this week due to a flurry of stories about the alleged relationship between your and the ancient near Eastern fertility goddess Asherah. 
drawing on ancient inscriptions that mention your and his Asherah, some scholars, notably William Dever and did God, have a wife. Archaeology and folk religion in ancient Israel have in recent years posited that the ancient Israelites worshipped Asherah and other deities alongside Yor, the God of the Old Testament. Now others have taken this a step further and claimed that your supposed wife Asherah was later edited out of the Bible by scribes with a monotheistic agenda. These theories sound a bit shocking at first read, and most of the articles reporting on them this week spin them as a damaging blow to the Christian understanding of God in the Bible. But on closer examination, these theories don't seriously challenge what the Old Testament tells us about ancient Israelite religion. That the ancient Israelites worshipped many different gods is not news to anyone who has read the Old Testament. Although God revealed himself to his people as the one and only true God, even singling out Asherah worship for condemnation, the Israelites, surrounded by other nations that worship many gods, constantly backslid into idolatry. This idolatry didn't always take the form of an outright denial of God rather than denying your, the Israelites would often start worshipping other deities. Like Asherah, alongside your, or sometimes they would worship your in a way that he had expressly forbidden. Much of the Old Testament describes the forbidden worship of pagan gods like Asherah and the Baals and the failure of Israel's leaders to outlaw such cults. This was a recurring theme for the biblical prophets. One of the most vivid passages in Jeremiah describes God's amazement at Israel's constant backsliding into idol worship, despite all that God had done for them, this is what the Lord says, what fault did your ancestors find in me, that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols, and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, backward where is the Lord, who brought us up out of Egypt, and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land, to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came, and defiled my land, and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me, the leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. So to the question did the ancient Israelites worship other gods, like Asherah, alongside Yor, the answer is clear, they certainly did. But what is also clear is that the Bible repeatedly and unequivocally condemns this, describing these pagan gods as nothing more than lifeless idols. To the more controversial question did God have a wife, the answer is also clear, nowhere. In the Bible, is this even hinted at, and people who claim this was the case must posit a conspiracy theory in which huge chunks of the Bible were retroactively rewritten to falsify the record. There is no manuscript evidence suggesting an earlier version of Israelite history that endorsed polytheism. Scholars continue to debate the development of Israel's understanding of God's uniquely revealed monotheism, but the burden of proof lies on the critics to demonstrate that this is more plausible than simply accepting the Bible text we have as genuine. But there is some nuance to this last question. The Bible clearly doesn't teach that you had a wife, but did the ancient Israelites believe that he did? It's not hard to imagine that some of them did. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat the Israelites' repeated embrace of idolatrous beliefs in contrast to the official doctrines they were taught. If the Israelites imagined you as a golden calf and set up Asherah poles in God's temple during their flirtations with polytheism, it's possible some of them cast Asherah as your divine consort as well. But whatever errant beliefs crept into Israelite folk religion, the clear and consistent teaching of the Bible is that God has neither divine rivals nor equals. What does the Bible say about Asherah and false idol worshippers? The association of Asherah with trees in the Hebrew Bible is very strong. For example, she is found under trees, 1 Kings 14.23, 2 Kings 17.10 and is made of wood by human beings, 1 Kings 14 15, 2 Kings 16, colon, 3, dash, 4. Deuteronomy 16 21 commands, you shall not plant any tree as a sacred pole, Asherah, beside the altar, that you make for the Lord your God, and 1 Kings 14 23 states, 
for they also build for themselves high places, villas, and sacred poles, Asherim, on every high hill, and under every green tree 2 Kings 23 to 7, and he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes who were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the Asherah. Exodus 34 to 13 You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars, and cut down their Asherim. Judges 3 to 7 And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and served the Baals and the Asherah. 1 Kings 16 33 And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. 2 Kings 17 16 And they abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made for themselves metal images of two calves, and they made an Asherah, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. What is the meaning of Asherah in the Bible? Definition of Asherah, a sacred wooden post, pole, or pillar that stood near the altar in various Canaanite high places and that symbolize the cultic false goddess Asherah. Asherah is a Hebrew word for what was either a goddess or a cultic object or perhaps both. Although many see evidence for Asherah being an individual goddess known to the Israelites, some scholars believe that the context of the word primarily denotes it as a cultic object, as Mark Smith suggests in the early history of God, you're in the other deities. In ancient Israel, second edition. The Bible frequently addresses Asherah, singular, and Asherim, plural, as cult symbols from the time of the Israelite judges until right before the destruction of Judah in the early 6th century BCE. On the other hand, some passages in the Bible clearly reference Asherah as being a goddess. In the Bible, the Iron Age text of 1 Kings 18:19 states that Asherah had prophets in Tyre, just as the Canaanite god Baal had prophets. Additionally, 2 Kings 23-6 declares that the priests of Solomon's temple brought out all the objects made for Baal and Asherah and all the host of heaven. This verse also seems to indicate that Asherah was at least sometimes considered to be a deity. Asherah and other deities Asherah had not been found in any Iron Age Tyrian or Phoenician texts and so 1 Kings 18-19 might possibly hint that the Israelites associated Asherah with the Iron Age Phoenician goddess Astarte. In the Bronze Age, the Canaanite Asherah, known as Atherat, the wife of Elan mother of the gods, was a principal deity in Tyre, and the connection of Asherah to the maternal goddess Istat has been a long-standing theory among scholars. However, the specific name of Astarte is also found in the Bible, such as in Judges 2 and 1 Samuel 7. Therefore, if there is a connection between Asherah and Astarte, they were also sometimes differentiated for reasons unknown. Asherah is often interlaced with various other deities of different names, and is believed to have a diverse iconography. Divine name changes and intercultural correlations are common in many ancient mythologies. Similarly, Asherah is often interlaced with various other deities of different names, and is believed to have a diverse iconography. Her mythology is hard to determine because, in addition to a start, she often took on attributes of Anat and Ishtar in Anna as well. In the Canaanite metropolis of Ugarit, she was known as Atherat, the wife of Elander Mother Goddess as the Mother of the Gods. Some scholars believe she was seen as early as the 2nd millennium BCE as a popular female deity in the Hittite culture. She may have also been associated with the goddess Elit. The Babylonian goddess Asherah appears to be a version of Asherah, and she was known for her eroticism. The Babylonians learned of her through the Amorites, who saw her as the consort of the god Amuru. In Babylon, she was thought to be the daughter-in-law of Anu, and was known as the Lady of the Steps. Her association with mountains in Babylon may be a hint to her Canaanite origins. From Canaanite mythology, else traditions and epithets were absorbed into the construct of the Israelite Yor, the god of the Hebrew Bible, and therefore it is likely that they acclimated Atherat slash Asherah as well. Archaeological evidence for this can be found in the 8th century BCE Kuntalid Adrad inscriptions, found in the northeast part of the Sinai Peninsula. These inscriptions are written in Hebrew, and translate as Yor and his Asherah. Asherah is also associated with Yor in a similar possessive sentence in the 8th century BCE Kerbat El Com inscriptions, found in the West Bank. Goddess Or. 
cultic object there is a debate as to whether these inscriptions refer to Asherah the goddess or an Asherah as cultic object. One reason for the debate is that in the Kuntalid Ajrad and Kerbat el Com inscriptions pronominal suffixes show your having possession of the noun Asherah, implying that this was an object. Ancient Hebrew did not use pronominal suffixes on proper nouns such as people or deities, however, other Semitic languages closely related to Hebrew did use such suffixes. Later in Israelite Deuteronomic tradition, Asherah and all deities other than your were strictly prohibited. Condemnations of Asherah appear to have been written in the 8th century BCE or later, cropping up at the same time as the Kuntalid Adrad and Kerbat el Com inscriptions. When not implying a goddess, the terms Asherah slash Asherim in the Bible refer to cultic objects which were wooden poles, images, or trees associated with pagan worship, and were supposed to have been destroyed by the Israelites. The verbs connected with Asherah slash Asherim in the Bible are words often associated with wood, such as fell, smash, and burn by fire. It is possible that the Asherim were originally living trees from which the wooden pole developed as a symbol of Asherah to be placed beside an altar. In extra-biblical contexts as well, the goddess Asherah was often represented as a stylized sacred tree. In the Bible, there appears to be a functional difference in the singular and plural forms of the word, with the singular being set up by altars and the plural in association with trees in high places. The following two verses demonstrate the distinction. Deuteronomy 1621 commands, You shall not plant any tree as a sacred pole, Asherah, beside the altar, that you make for the Lord your God, and 1 Kings 1423 states, for they also built for themselves high places, pillars, and sacred poles, Asherim, on every high hill, and under every green tree these are just two. Examples out of several which consistently relate separate locations for the singular and plural forms. One theory proposed by J.R. Engel is that the plural Asherim were associated with Judean pillar figurines, while the singular Asherah was a wooden pole. Although it is an interesting and often accepted theory, there is nothing in the biblical text that implies the Asherim were clay figures. However, along with the disappearance of the Judean pillar figurines from the archaeological record, so did the Asherah cult disappear from Judean sites after the Babylonian exile. Addressing the burning of children. What does the Bible say about burning children as a sacrifice? Leviticus 18.21, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Marlech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Leviticus 20, colon 2, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel that giveth any of his seed unto Marlech, he shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 20, colon 3, He hath given of his seed unto Marlech, to defile my sanctuary, and to profane my holy name. Leviticus 20, colon 4, And if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth his seed unto Marlech, and kill him not. Leviticus 20, colon 5, I will set my face against that man, and against his family, and will cut him off, and all that go whoring after him, to commit whoredom with Marlech, from among their people. Scholars have compared these biblical references to Greek and Latin accounts which spoke of fire-centric child sacrifices in the Carthaginian city of Punic. Plutarch, for instance, wrote of burning children as an offering Baalhanan, though they mistakenly attribute these sacrifices to the Roman gods Cronus and Saturn. Marloch is one of Satan's chief warriors, and one of the greatest fallen angels the devil has on his side. He is given a speech at Hell's Parliament, where he advocates for immediate war against God, and is then revered on earth as a pagan god, much to God's chagrin 18th century depiction of the Moloch idol, the idol Moloch with seven chambers or chapels. It was believed these statues had seven chambers, one of which was reserved for child sacrifices. The religion of the Canaanites was a hodgepodge of ancient Semitic faiths. Practiced by the people of the Levant region from at least the early Bronze Age, the cult of Moloch was still active into the first few centuries of the Common Era. More Bible scripture on Moloch and its cult and the sacrificing of children. Leviticus 18.21 You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord your God, I am the Lord. 
Deuteronomy 1231 You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for every abominable thing that the Lord hates they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Ezekiel 1620-21 And you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whorings so small a matter, that you slaughtered my children, and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? Jeremiah 731 And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. Leviticus 20 colon 1 dash 5 The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who gives any of his children to Marlet shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I myself will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he has given one of his children to Marlet to make my sanctuary unclean, and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man, when he gives one of his children to Marlech, and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man, and against his clan, and will cut them off. From among their people, him and all who follow him in whoring after Marlech. Psalm 106, colon, 37, dash, 38 They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons, they poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Did God allow human sacrifice? Bible question, my question has to do with Judges. 1130 1130-39 why would God allow Jephthah to sacrifice his daughter as a burnt sacrifice when child sacrifice was strictly forbidden by God? It was a stupid vow for Jephthah to make, and I guess I was hoping that, because God must have known this would happen, that he would just tell Jephthah of his stupidity instead of actually allowing it to happen. I have heard two responses to this. I have read. That some think Jephthah ended up giving his daughter as a living sacrifice, but the Bible does not say this. I have also read, that God allowed it to teach us not to make foolish deals with God, because we are not to bargain with God. If God wants to bless us, he does not want there to be strings attached. It is to be a blessing not a bargain. Bible Answer, Judges 1129 40 Records the well-known historical event when Jephthah made a vow and ultimately it was his daughter who was made to fulfill the vow. His vow is recorded in Judges 1130-31. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Judges 1130-31, NASB, later Jephthah's daughter came out of the house when her father arrived. As a result, his daughter willingly fulfilled the vow, Judges 1134-40. Those who believe that Jephthah sacrificed his daughter have wondered, why did God allow Jephthah to sacrifice his daughter? This is an important question if Jephthah did in fact kill his daughter and offer her as a burnt offering. What follows provides an answer to this troublesome question. First view, Jephthah sacrificed his daughter, if Jephthah did sacrifice his daughter, in order to fulfill his vow, then it is obvious, that God allowed him to kill his daughter, and it is obvious, that God allowed his daughter to give herself as a sacrifice. It is wrong to be critical of, Jephthah for sacrificing his daughter and to ignore her statement in Judges 1136-37, so she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord, do to me as you have said, since the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the sons of Ammon. She said to her father, Let this thing be done for me, let me alone two months, that I may go to the mountains and weep, because of my virginity, I, and my companions. Judges 1136-37, NASB, when she said, do to me as you have said, she used the imperative. That is, she commanded or every strongly urged her father to do this thing. She is not an innocent in this event. If we assume that she was sacrificed, why did God allow this? It is important to realize that God allows each of us to commit horrible sins. 
we are the ones who choose to sin, not God. Murder is not any worse than anger. Note in Matthew 5:21-22, Jesus points out that anger is as evil as murder. You have heard that the ancients were told, backquote, you shall not commit murder and backquote, whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, backquote, you, good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court, and whoever says, backquote, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Matthew 5:21-22 NASB Therefore we must ask why God allows us to be angry why does God allows us to destroy another person's reputation with slander and hurt others with our horrible words when James 5:29 commands us to stop complaining against one another the greek word for complaining means to groan that is we are to stop groaning against others in James 3 colon 8 dash 10 we are told that our tongue is evil and full of poison and we destroy people with it. But no one can tame the tongue, it is a restless evil and full of deadly poison point with it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. James 3 colon 8 dash 10 NASB Therefore, why does God allow us to curse others? Why does allow you to disobey him? Why does God allow people to commit sexual sins? The answer is that God is not responsible. We are responsible. God has commanded us to obey him. Should he prevent us from sinning? Should he only let you to act righteously? Ecclesiast 729 teaches that God made Adam upright, but we have sought out evil. God allows us to sin. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. Ecclesiast 729, NASB, God created mankind with a will, allowing us to choose. He did not create robots, but humans with a free will. God's desire was for us to choose to love, worship and obey him. We must remember that both Jephthah and his daughter were in agreement as to what would happen. She urged her father to fulfill his vow. Why was it right for God to slaughter women and children in the Old Testament? How can that ever be right? It's right for God to slaughter women and children any time he pleases. God gives life and he takes life. Everybody who dies, dies because God wills that they die. God is taking life every day. He will take 50,000 lives today. Life is in God's hand. God decides when your last heartbeat will be and whether it ends through cancer or a bullet wound. God governs. So God is God. He rules and governs everything. And everything he does is just and right and good. God owes us nothing. If I were to drop dead right now, or a suicide bomber downstairs, were to blow this building up, and I were blown into smithereens, God would have done me no wrong. He does no wrong to anybody when he takes their life, whether at two weeks, or at age 92. God is not beholden to us at all. He doesn't owe us anything. Now add to that the fact we are all sinners and deserve to die and go to hell yesterday and the reality that we are even breathing today is sheer common grace from God. I could make the question harder. As it was stated, it doesn't feel hard to me because God was stated as the actor. My basic answer is that the Old and New Testaments present God as the one who has total rights over my life and over my death. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord Job 121. How he takes away is his call. He never wrongs. Anybody. How would you state it to make the question harder? The part that makes it harder is, that he commands people to do it. He commanded Joshua to slaughter people, okay. You've got human beings killing humans, and therefore a moral question of what is right to do. The Bible says, thou shalt not murder, yet God says to Joshua, go in and clean house, and don't leave anything breathing. Don't leave a donkey, child, woman, old man or old woman breathing. Wipe out Jericho. 
My answer to that is that there is a point in history, a season in history, where God is the immediate king of a people, Israel, different than the way he is the king over the church, which is from all the peoples of Israel, and does not have a political ethnic dimension to it. With Joshua there was a political ethnic dimension, God was immediate king, and he uses this people as his instrument, to accomplish his judgment in the world at that time. And God, it says, let the sins of the Amorites accumulate for 400 years, so that they would be full, Genesis 15 16, and then sends his own people in as instruments of judgment. So I would vindicate Joshua, by saying that in that setting, with that relationship, between God and his people, it was right for Joshua to do what God told him to do, which was to annihilate the people. But that's much more complex morally than saying, that God does it. He can cause a flood, and kill everybody on the planet except eight people, and not do a single one of them any wrong. But he didn't ask anybody else to do that. It gets difficult, when he uses others. An example of this. Right now is that God has given the sword to the government, Romans 13, colon 4. Therefore I believe the government has a right to take a rapist and a murderer and to put him in jail. Or to kill him. I think capital punishment is consistent with Genesis 9 and consistent with God's character, because of the value of man, the blood of man shall be shed for taking the blood of a man Genesis 9, colon 6, but, that's very different than saying, that anybody can go around killing people. So God has his times and seasons for, when he shares his authority, to take and give life. And the church today is not Israel, and we are not a political entity. Therefore the word we have from the Lord today is, love your enemy. Pray for those who abuse you. Lay your life down for the world. Don't kill in order to spread the gospel, but die to spread it. Just because the ones who did the killing for God are sinners, means nothing. Just means they are sinners. As are all men and women. So that adds nothing to this. Just because you're a man of God does not mean. You do not sin and God was eliminating a generation of evil. People that would grow to do nothing but evil so, if it meant for God, to kill them, before they could do a lifetime of evil, that's, only God's knowledge. He removed them, because he creates all things, we are the ones who have the free will to do evil or not. So, God can kill evil or even evil, before it becomes evil. A bloodline that is against God, that is rebellious to God, can be wiped out as it should. We are unable to comprehend what God can comprehend. God can convert something evil into something good. It's wrong for us to kill each other women and children. God is the creator it's not wrong for him. Only God knows what life these children were going to live because he is God. So our argument is invalid and out of ignorance and our basic understanding and emotion has no ability to comprehend what terms God would do this, or allow this, and how it could be good, or eliminating evil to later maybe hundreds of years later for the greater good, or la sinners. And God can use us to destroy other sinners or children of a bloodline of rebellious future sinners. He knows their future. God does not give life force sin to rule. But only for a period of time will God allow evil to reign. And every evil thing that has been done will be accounted for. Who are we to judge God's actions? Or what happens and why? Over thousands of years. Right now. All who are being born right now are sinners and most likely will live a life of sin. They already we already don't deserve life. And we don't use our lives to serve God the one who created us. Which is blasphemy. Already. Imagine having a child. And the child looks at you and says. I don't believe you exist. You're not my father. Imagine your own creation. Denying you. You would still love them. And pain to know they must not be well. They must be sick. For them to deny their own father or creator. God's purpose for us was not sin. Sin was never supposed to be here. So no one right now all children and adults are not supposed to even have life. Because of sin. We were born into sin, because of Adam and Eve. Well. Mostly Eve. But he still gave life to us, and gave us free will, in fact he even gave us a way to be redeemed, and earn life back. From death. 
and sin. And be forgiven of sin. And we still mock our creator and deny him. And fight against him. In reality fighting against ourselves. Fighting against our own gift of life. That's why there is so much corruption evil and death in this world.